and my advisor is Ron Mangan. And in the Mangan lab, we study the neural mechanisms of attention, how attention is implemented in the brain. We think of attention as the cognitive ability that enables the selective processing of task relevant information and maybe the suppression also of task irrelevant or distracting information. And we're interested in both the orienting process of attention. So like how the brain figures out what is task relevant, what is distracting, but we're also interested in the mechanisms of enhancement themselves. So once attention has been oriented to some kind of sensory information or internal process, how is it exactly that that information that's targeted is preferentially processed or enhanced in some way or allowed to propagate through higher levels of processing, uh, access other forms of cognition, that type of thing. Uh, specifically, I'm going to be presenting some work that I've been doing for my dissertation that answers this latter question of like the, the selective enhancement of sensory information. I'm gonna be talking about visual attention. Um, one factor that we think might be important for this selective enhancement of information that's afforded by attention involves the modulation of alpha band, eight to 12 Hertz oscillatory neural activity. So kind of like what Mattia was talking about before. Um, alpha band activity is thought to reflect, and you can measure it with EEG, which is kind of cool. And it's thought to reflect a widespread synchronized firing across a large neural population that might um, influence the excitability of neurons in the population that generate that signal, that alpha signal. And so therefore, if the brain can selectively modulate alpha power, you know, in, in different parts of the brain simultaneously, that could be part of a mechanism of selective gating that, to control the flow of sensory signals through hierarchical stages of processing. There's been widespread study of the role of alpha band activity in, in uh, visual attention to low level visual features like spatial, like regions of space. So for example, um, if you're attending to the left side of visual space covertly, then you see a concomitant drop in alpha power over the right visual hemisphere, which is the visual area that receives signals from the left visual field um, relative to the left visual hemisphere. And one study at least that I know of has shown a anal an analogous modulation of alpha power to uh, in, a, in a task that that uh, directed participants to attend to slightly higher level visual features. So like motion and color. And what we wanted to ask here with this, with this experiment is, that I'm gonna present is whether we could extend that basic idea even further is alpha band modulation, a general mechanism of selection throughout the entire visual system. And in particular, would we be able to observe modulation of alpha power that's systematic and depends on the category of object that someone attends to. So, um, so I'm basically in this presentation, I'm going to describe three experiments really quickly that we ran to answer this question. The first one is the main experiment and the second two are, are controlling for different alternative interpretations of our result from the first experiment. Uh, so the experiment, the first experiment, the main experiment we did was an, an anticipatory object-based attention experiment. We used arbitrary shape cues to alert our participants to the subsequent appearance of one of three object categories. We had 60 different images, 60 different exemplars for each object category. Our object categories were faces, scenes, and tools. And I know that those like faces and scenes in particular seem kind of, it seems weird to think about them as objects, but in, within the framework that we're working in, we're just thinking of objects as like high level visual representations of visual input, higher than the kind of lower level features such as color or motion uh, or orientation, things like that. Um, within each object category, there were two subcategories. So within faces, we had images of male and female faces. Within scenes, we had images of natural scenes and urban scenes. And within tools, we had images of power tools, things like power drills or trucks or cranes and non-powered tools, uh, like a wrench, like, or yeah, like pliers, a screwdriver, a broom, that type of thing. And the task that our participants had to perform was to discriminate the that like subcategory to press one button if the image that they saw the target image belonged to one one subcategory and a different button if it belonged to the other subcategory. Um, the cue that they saw before the target presentation kind of alerted them to the category of image that they had to perform this discrimination within, and we were hoping that by queuing our participants to the object category, they'd be able to perform that discrimination faster and more accurately 
than if they were queued to a different object category and then we switched the target that was presented. So this is kind of analogous to the invalid valid trial design in a, in a Posner queuing task where maybe you're queued to the left but then the target appears on the right 20% of the time. And that's just a way to operationalize attention behaviorally. We can compare reaction time or accuracy between the validly queued and the invalidly queued trials in order to attribute some kind of behavioral performance benefit of attention to our participants' behavior. Um, so this was our object-based attention paradigm that's designed to be analogous to a Posner queuing paradigm or its other similar paradigms. We were particularly interested in this anticipatory period here between the queue and the target and what was going on in the EEG here. Um, oh, so first, before I get to the EEG, this is just some, some evidence that we were in fact engendering some kind of object-based attention effect with our experimental design. Uh, reaction times were much faster for validly queued object trials compared to invalidly queued object trials across all three object categories. So that gave us the confidence that we were really engendering object-based attention. And when we looked at the EEG, we could attribute what we found in EEG to that specific form of attention. Uh, in order to assess whether there were differences in scalp level EEG patterns of alpha power, we used support vector machine decoding because we didn't have any strong hypotheses about what the distributions would look like. And de this decoding approach is just a straightforward way to ask how much information there is about a specific experimental condition in the data that you feed into the model. Uh, this figure that I'm showing on the right in this gray period here, this is before the queue onset and the orange period is after the queue. This is all before the target presentation. So this is all during this anticipatory phase. Decoding accuracy relative to chance is shown on the vertical and the blue dots denote the time points that are deemed to be statistically significant. So in these times, there are statistically significant differences in alpha power patterns on the scalp between the three object attention conditions. This confirmed a hypothesis that we would be able to observe alpha power differences between diff that, that vary systematically depending on what category of object you're attending to. So you might think as we did that there are other factors that could contribute to our result. And so we designed two follow-up experiments just to, to make sure that no other extraneous factors could explain the pattern of results we found and that to be extra confident that we were really homing in on object-based attention driving these alpha power differences. Uh, experiment two is really simple. It's exactly the same design, but there's, in, this, in this case, there's no anticipation really, or there's no uh, object-based attention in the anticipatory period. The cues are now completely non-predictive at all. Whereas previously they are 80% predictive, allowing people to use attention in anticipation. Now they're just completely random. And we, so we wanted to test whether the pattern of alpha results we got um, could, could be attributed to just the bottom up sensory processes of seeing that Q shape. That's something that you need to worry about when you're doing this kind of decoding. Um, what we found was that any kind of statistically significant differences in alpha power attributable just to the bottom up processing of different shapes that has nothing to do with the higher level cognitive operations of attention is limited to the zero to 200 millisecond window. So before in experiment one, we saw this significant decoding over here and because in experiment two, we only found it here, we could be more confident than in experiment one, oops, um, we, were really, we were really homing in on object-based attention in this period. In experiment three, we wanted to test the possibility that we were just decoding different task sets between the different object conditions. So we equalized the task acro across all, uh, all three object categories. Whereas before, if, for example, if you were queued to face, you knew that you had to discriminate between a male and female face. And that's different, a, a fundamentally different kind of discrimination from discriminating a natural versus urban scene. That kind of task set might feasibly have been driving our decoding results. It at least isn't a mutually exclusive uh, explanation. So we wanted to rule out any kind of task set differences. So now the task is simply for whatever kind of object category you're queued to, you have to say whether it's blurry or in focus. I'm gonna go through, I, I could take a little longer to explain this more because it's a little confusing, but I'm running a little short on time. So I'm just gonna go to the result. Uh, basically the takeaway message here is that when we control for task set so that the task is equalized across all our object categories, we kind of replicate our main result. We get a statistically significant period of alpha band decoding in this late period. Um, and when we compare that to experiment one, it even maybe looks a little nicer, which is kind of cool. 
Uh, oh, but I should note that our subject size uh, set is a little smaller here, and that's because we were collecting this data right up against the very beginning of the shelter in place order. So we were kind of limited in what we could do here. Luckily, though, uh, it replicated nicely, even with a smaller subject with a smaller n. And so uh, like kind of the takeaway message is that we were excited to confirm our hypothesis that we could extend the idea that alpha might be part of the mechanism for selective attention to higher levels of the visual system, higher than just spatial attention or feature based attention. And as a next step, we really want to try to localize where those modulations are happening. We might expect that if you're anticipating a face, there are space selective regions of the visual system, like the fusiform face area. And we, and if this model of alpha as a gating mechanism is actually true, we should be able to show that alpha power is actually is locally decreasing in face selective visual regions. In order to do that, we'd probably need to do something like fMRI EEG combined. Um, so that's kind of the next step. We'll see if we ever get to do that though before I graduate, if I graduate. Um, okay, so. I think I'll probably just leave it there in case anyone has any questions. And if there are no questions, I'll, uh, I'll go back and talk about things in a little bit more detail. But if you want to read more detail about the paradigm or the methods, the analysis, anything like that, I'd, I'd point you towards the recently published article in Journal of Neuroscience. And thank you very much for watching. Thanks, Dean. We have one question for you. Uh, from Brad Postle, he says, can you interpret your results in a predictive code fr framework? Um, the only way I've tried to link predictive coding to what I've been studying at all is, is trying to explain like what the functional reason that alpha oscillations exist in the brain. What is that functional reason? And in, as far as I know, in the predictive coding world, there's like there, there are oscillations that can occur because it takes uh, some time for sensory evidence to accumulate and then for predictions to be updated uh, in, according to whatever kind of error they've accumulated. Um, so I, I haven't tried to figure out how general gating as a mechanism of attention could fit into that, but I, I think it probably has something to do with the link between oscillatory activity and the time between like prediction refreshes. Sorry, I don't have a better answer. I wish I did. Predictive coding is super interesting. And I, I'd like to think about this, this line of work more within that framework in the future. We, ha we have one more question for you. Would you see anticipatory activity, so temporary specific, if the delay was exponential distributed? Was it so in your task? Um, sorry, I'm going to exit my screen so I can read the question, because I didn't quite catch that. Is it in the Q&A? Yeah, click the Q&A. I can read it again for you. The first question from, uh, he's, he says, hi, she- Oh, okay, I got it. On super activity as temporary specific, if the delay was exponentially distributed, was it so in your task? So our delay was not distributed over a very wide range for one thing. It was one second to 2.5 seconds. Uh, it was somewhere within that range. Um, I'm gonna go back to share my screen now, just so I can go to a figure. Um, so in any of these decoding figures that I showed, we, I cut off the decoding period at one second because that was the earliest possible onset of a target. And I didn't want to include any target information, like sensory information in my decoding. But you could argue that this decoding um, is is kind of like smeared the the positive the above chance decoding accuracy is kind of smeared out and you would ex maybe you would expect it to occur like right before the target onset even stronger and because this is the very earliest target onset maybe it's not as strong as it could be here but i think because the range the participants learned over time with the training and with performing the task that the earliest onset would be about a thousand milliseconds they would have to be ready to perform the task before a thousand milliseconds. So I think that probably explains a little bit why there's this temporal specificity. Um, I don't have a good explanation for why the decoding accuracy drops down in experiment one towards chance at the very end of the, uh, the anticipatory epoch. But I would say that maybe it's some form of noise because when we replicated in experiment three, we didn't see that same pattern so I, I guess if this answers your question at all, sorry if it doesn't, but I think that the, what looks like temporal specificity might just be P 
purely the participants know that the target will appear one second after the queue, so they need to be prepared for it. Thank you. Unfortunately, I mean, although we have more questions for you, we don't.